All right, everyone, the John McCain's who want World War III appear to be getting their way at the moment because uh, U.S.-Russia relations have begun to break down. Even the legacy media is starting to notice. And funnily enough, at first they were sort of calling for it. They're like, hey, it's going to be so wonderful. You know, we can dickwag after the Russians, maybe kill a million people. They were all gung-ho. Now they realize the true ramification is, hey, you die too. And they're like, oh, you know, maybe this will be a little bit of a problem. The other thing is they want to blame Trump for it. If there are problems that erupt from the fact that the U.S. doesn't fully get along with Putin and that the Russian and uh, U.S. Uh, nations are kind of at diplomatic and certainly fiscal odds, if things break down and cause problems, they're going to jump down Trump's throat. Oh, why didn't you repair relations with Russia? Even though <laughs> it was him, it was them and his various political uh, opponents that were the ones that actually caused this. Now, it's not just Obama's fault. There was a decided problem that emerged, uh, second term Obama especially. Towards the end of his second term, there was basically no dialogue at all with the Russian state. But it really goes back to the Bush administration, oddly enough. Bush originally had a good relationship with Putin. Now, you'll remember these same media firms that are saying, oh, it's so evil that Trump spoke well of Putin once. They had no problem with that when Bush was the president. That was one of the few things they didn't jump down his throat about towards the end of his presidency was the fact that he had been capable of conducting uh, normal relations with Putin because they understood and they were willing to be honest enough to tell the public, hey, countries are supposed to work with each other. You know, the funny thing is when they say, well, he, he had Putin, uh, he had journalists killed or he's like an oligarch. Well, then why don't you criticize our relationship with, you know, a hundred other countries in the world that are tin horn regimes, AKA anything out of, we out of the Western sphere at large for the most part, it's still basically the same way it was a century ago. Big man, big stick politics, uh, military rule, oligarchies, uh, monarchist systems in which the monarchs basically uh, siphon all of the wealth of the population and live like royalty does uh, while everyone else starves. The few countries that were developing uh, we've bombed back to the Stone Age and the media had no problem with it, like Gaddafi's Libya. Gaddafi's Libya, despite him being a dictator, was beginning to develop and look a lot more like huh, almost a Western European style country. We can't have that, said the Pentagon. We can't have that, said the House of Commons. Oh no, this is terrible, said Hillary Clinton. You know, uh, you know, Bill used to ramble about how evil Gaddafi was. I gotta take care of this shit. Hey, Obama, get, get the planes ready. And of course, in a very short span of time, now Libya has devolved into sub third world, utter complete misery. Uh, and they shake each other's hands and congratulate themselves on a job well done. I think we should have decent relations with other countries. We should be able to criticize what we see that's wrong, but we should at least be able to avoid, oh, I don't know, a shooting war. That might be nice. And then you look at the DPRK. Trump has managed to make headway there. Uh, the DPRK at the moment is more or less contained. Like there, there are so many ships floating around the peninsula at this point, they, they'd get hammered. Uh, they'd get their asses handed to them in a military capacity within a few hours. Uh, between the ROK, Japan, and the naval presence we have there, um, they, Pyongyang would be flatlined, essentially. Uh, they wouldn't be able to launch a response because they'd have no air superiority after a very short period of time. You know, Seoul would be completely gone. It'd be a crater because of all the artillery, assuming that all those pieces work, and there's no guarantee that they do. How about maybe 90% of them turn out to be just for decoration? It's just more North Korean propaganda, and it turns out that most of them don't work. Or they start firing and half of them break and they just explode on their platforms. Now, wouldn't that be a hoot? Because then it's like, well, uh, there goes our concerns, I guess. This will be easier than we thought. Uh, DPRK, Trump has contained them. But they're going to break containment in the future, probably during his presidency. It could be a, a year or two away because the thing is, and I've said this, and people are going to see that I'm right, their end goal is to develop a nuclear deterrent capable of preventing us or anyone else from bothering to get involved when they attempt to reunify by force by overrunning South Korea. The first thing that they will do is they'll say, all foreign powers need to know, we now have nuclear submarines stationed around the Pacific, we will nuke anybody who gets involved. Korea is ours. They'll go to the ROK and they'll say, you will stand down and accept reunification on our terms. We'll, we'll show you a little bit of mercy. We'll adopt kind of a mixed system. Or we'll, we'll allow your political uh, leaders to live, you know, in a gulag or a salt mine or something, but they can live. We'll be merciful to you. You'll get an extra bowl of rice because, you know, that'll be good eating compared to the average North Korean. 
Uh, but you're gonna stand down. If you don't, we're going to unleash nuclear hellfire on you. Everyone else, nobody's gonna help you. Now, won't we look absolutely monstrously weak that we can't even contain North Korea at that point? That we, you can imagine, I don't even think Trump would have the balls to get involved if it meant the possibility of inviting nuclear strikes on, on the United States. I don't think he would. Uh, they're already capable of hitting Hawaii, not reliably, but they are. Uh, parts of Alaska and maybe parts of the West Coast. They are fast developing the capability to do much more. So now Trump's like, well, we're going to increase our anti-missile systems. Basically, the only hope that you have. The problem is those systems are 50-50 as to whether they actually intercept an incoming missile. And North Korea's got a lot of missiles that aren't nuclear. Look, let's say they take 10 nuclear missiles. Say, okay, we're going to you know, launch these at the U.S. because they're attempting to intervene. And then they launch, oh, I don't know, five or 600 decoys, which are a lot cheaper because they're not even armed. There's nothing to them. It's a standard explosive or, or nothing, a cannonball or something in their tip. And that's all it is. What if they do that? Well, it'll overwhelm the anti-missile system so completely that it's not going to work. There's no way to build the anti-missile system because of its lack of efficiency and its need for multiple projectiles will never be as cheap or efficient as simply attacking with missiles make almost more sense to ignore it entirely and just launch a nuclear barrage at North Korea to end their misery. Uh, and that would be a disaster on a world stage. That would really freeze relations. Like China would never forgive us. It'd be a hundred years before they'd even accept a fucking phone call after that. And by the way, Trump has only managed to make that headway after giving up on the idea of saying, no, there's two Chinas. Taiwan is fully and utterly sovereign, a separate state, and always will be backed by U.S. guarantees. Instead, he just does what past presidents have done and give them more firepower, which China doesn't care about. Taiwan's a little island with, you know, what is it, 120th the manpower or something of China, or I think cons actually probably considerably less than that. It doesn't matter how many tanks they have. It doesn't matter how many artillery pieces they have. The Chinese Air Force uh, would completely destroy Taiwan overnight. Uh, it'd basically be like us beating up on North Korea and anything but a nuclear exchange. Is this is no comparison between the two. I am telling you that North Korea's end goal is to develop a nuclear deterrent that ensures that the U.S. gets hit if it intervenes and honors its its contractual obligation, its treaties, uh, its alliance with South Korea to defend them. The problem is that once Korea is reunified, the North Korean government, which will now have control of considerably greater manpower and resources, as well as any military materials left over from South Korea's loss, uh, because they'll probably have to unleash a few atomic weapons to drive the point home and overcome them. Who's to say they won't attack Japan? And by the way, how do we get involved? If they decide to go fully imperialistic, the problem with the standoff between nuclear powers is that if a rogue nuclear power in a more than bipolar nuclear situation goes totally apeshit and uh, begins attacking things, what nuclear power is going to risk being hit with nuclear weapons to defend a state that's not even theirs? Unless it is the closest of allies you can imagine. Like, if somebody tried to nuke the UK, we'd probably get involved. But if somebody tried to nuke Spain, despite the fact that, yeah, we've got treaties with them, good trade relations, good diplomacy, we're friends, do you honestly think that the United States would be willing to step in and defend them? At the hazard of, oh, I don't know, maybe 100 million Americans dying. I don't think any president would. I honestly don't think so. And if we did, we would still lose because then we've depleted part of our nuclear stockpile. And what if, by the way, it doesn't work? What if the missile blows up on the side um, in the silo? Then we look really weak. We've depleted that. We've lost a huge proportion of our economy. It's going to take us decades to rebuild. We fall behind the other great nuclear powers, Russia and China. We end up being the third wheel of the world. We'd no longer be the world power. We can't respond at that point. We have to do something now. Otherwise, we're screwed long term. The Pentagon has to know this. There's a reason why Trump's posturing the way he is. He's going to try to get China to be alongside us. If China and the U.S. work together, North Korea won't last 10 minutes. The problem is trying to get that to happen will probably force us to give up Taiwan. I'm serious. Taiwan will probably lose its sovereignty. To the Taiwanese people, I feel sorry for you dudes. Uh, but you may want to uh, think about if things get a little dicey over there you may want to think about evacuating Taiwan even though technically you're not under fire because what'll happen next will surprise you I think that's assuming the US and China work together if we go it alone 
and we still probably get hit by nuclear weapons at that point anyway. Maybe if we do that now, we survive the encounter intact as the world's main power player. Otherwise, uh, we get egg on our face, lose a lot of our manpower, get hit with nuclear, you know, that radiation is going to fuck up a lot of cropland too. Yeah, oh, the Napa Valley is, is such a beautiful color of green, even at night now. Uh, <laughs> this wine glows in the dark. It's like, they'll have to market that shit. They'll probably have to sell it in Japan, where it'd be, it'd be gimmicky. It'd be considered cool, I guess. You know, start uh, making a glow-in-the-dark sake. That would actually be something I would try. Not gonna lie, I don't care if it's irradiated. I pro I'm, I'm probably dumb enough to drink one of those. Uh, especially if it causes your pee to glow. That'd be even cooler. Uh, but seriously, we need what we need to do as a country, have decent relations with Russia. You know, you don't have to be buddy-buddy, but you have to be able to talk to them. And it looks like even it, Trump is sort of bowing before constant pressure from people. Who's, oh, he's working with the Russians. It's evil. He's Putin's puppet. So now he's like, he arms the Ukrainians, won't re return Putin's phone calls, and they're still calling him a Russian puppet. He should just give up on uh, salvaging that situation, say, you know, to hell with you. I'm going to have normal relations with my fellow world leader, and we're going to try to avoid, you know, people getting nuked. And then we need to work with them and with the Chinese on North Korea. We need to warn the Taiwanese of the larger ramifications of the possibility of involvement there. Because I can tell you that's got to be a contingency. Oh, we'll just trade Taiwan for getting rid of North Korea. We lose our vassal next to China. Korea's reunified. Um, and China loses its vassal. But it also eliminates a country that's become diplomatically prob uh, problematic for them. Everybody wins. Look, we have good relations. You know, U.S.-Sino relations would be great. It's not... Uh, uh, people need to understand that it goes beyond just, hey, we go in and beat up North Korea and everything's fine and dandy. Now, it gets more complex than that, and our anti-missile system is basically a joke. I think the Russian system is actually now better than ours. Now, who, who would have seen that coming? Oh, well, anyone who saw what Obama did to the military, it's sort of like the space race. SpaceX, our, our private industry has to come in and make better rockets because NASA is no longer doing anything other than sitting on its ass monitoring clouds. Yeah, we've got lots of cool toys, kids, but I'm sorry, we're not going to the out into orbit because, you know, we have to rely on Russia to get us there. And we're not too keen on that idea. It just doesn't make any sense. This is what Obama did to NASA, too. Yeah, oddly enough, so far, Trump has been the pro-science president. He's sort of like a Gerald Ford. Now, you could read into that what you want. Oh, well, that means that he trips, he's incoherent, and he's a one-termer. Okay, jokes aside, though. On the end of, like, space and military, he's beginning to look a little bit like a Gerald Ford. Which is, is not bad, at least in, in those aspects. Anything else would be a disaster, uh, as we saw with Gerald Ford. His football presidency, you know, wasn't a great time for the country. Most people don't even uh, remember that Gerald Ford existed, which is perhaps uh, sad, considering, you know, some of his decent contributions in those fields, uh, policy-wise. But I think Trump is doing okay, but the problem is he's being muzzled by Congress. They're telling him you can't talk to Russia. Uh, you can't make deals with anyone, basically. Look, Congress now uh, is attempting to usurp the executive uh, system of diplomacy that typically has existed. Typically, the president in the figurehead capacity, it's not really an official power so much as the ability to heal wounds cross-culture by talking to people and shaking their hand and having a good meal and saying, yeah, oh, oh you're, the women in your country are so beautiful. Oh, this is wonderful wine, Mr. Hollande. You know, what's it? Oh, yeah. Can I take like a dozen of these home? I'll get you something from the Napa Valley. Oh, you don't want that? How about some beer instead? You know, you like to get drunk, so it shouldn't matter. That's sort of what presidents are for, ultimately. A big part of their power is simple diplomacy, and it's not even tech, it's not even legally binding. You know, Congress does the treaties and shit and has to sign off on things, but the president can get the ball rolling because, you know, does Congress really want to say, well, our president has enacted a potential treaty with another country. They get along so well, it'll strengthen our bonds, maybe form a, a long-term alliance. Oh, but we're going to say no to that. Generally, it doesn't happen. For the first time, though, Congress is totally off its rocker when it comes to a foreign state. Like, relations with Russia would be better if it were just Trump himself talking to Vladimir Putin for a few hours each week. But the problem is, if he does that, the press here, the, the legacy media at least, and Congress will say, oh, see, the president is like a Putin puppet. He's trying, he's, he's going to do what Clinton did and sell nuclear material to them. You know, it was okay then because Obama was the president and he was so great on foreign policy. But Trump, oh, he's evil. He's orange and stuff. 
Uh, I, yeah, I don't, I don't agree with that. I think that's a bad idea. Yeah, we're back in the Cold War. Congrats, uh, Congress. You really, congrats, uh, Bush and Obama and all the people in Congress who were there the whole time other than, like, Ron and Rand. Like, again, the same people in the room, the only people who know what the hell they're talking about, usually. Uh, th congratulations, the American people, thank you. At least now we can have 80s music. Can we at least have that? Can we have good music? that's prefaced on the idea that, hey, we're gonna die tomorrow, so let's have a total coke bender. Can we have that back? Then it'll be maybe, uh, then it'll be worth it. And we won't get nuked because everyone will be listening to our music, so they won't wanna like stop that from being produced and it'll save us from nuclear fire. That's about all. Peace out.